Welcome to another Village Torah session. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew. I don't know what happened to the recording of the Zoom session. For those of you who are on the Zoom uh, and are watching this, I don't know what happened to the recording, so I am doing this all over. This will be a little bit briefer than the Zoom discussion that we had. And uh, this week's Torah portion is Parashat Titzaveh. We are still in the book of Exodus. This is, and if you wanted to follow along, what I'm going to do here is not really a, a deep uh, dive necessarily, although there is one particular topic I do want to drill down a little bit into and derive some meaning for us, but I want to provide an introductory overview. If you're interested in following along in your apartments or your rooms, this week's Torah portion is found in chapter 27, beginning with verse 20 and continuing all the way till chapter 30, verse 10. So just uh, last week we had Parashat Truma. In Parashat Truma, God is asking, requesting, demanding that certain things be brought together for what I described last week as God's, a nice way of putting it is, is his apartments, his apartment. It's God's dwelling amidst the Jewish people, amidst the children of Israel, or as I like the expression, his pied terre, his easy access to the children of Israel and how to furnish it. That was what was going on in last week's Torah portion. This week, I would like to broadly describe two main things that appear in this week's Torah portion, the first of which is about the vestments. It's a fancy word for the dress, the garments, or as I like to describe it, the uniforms of Aaron and his sons. Now, Aaron is the brother of Moses, and he gets assigned this role of high priest, Kohen Gadol, high priest. And as such, he has uh, certain responsibilities and also uh, special garments, a lot of special garments. His sons and all the different uh, other priests, the Kohanim, they have a certain set of garments, a certain uniform I like to describe. It's mainly a tunic, there's some other, th a sash, some other things. The high priest, however, has a lot more going on. A hat, a special golden plate that says two words, Kodesh Ladonoi, or holy to the Lord. He has a special uh, breastplate that has, it's really colorful. He has on the bottom these pomegranate tassels or little bells that make noise when he walks around. Very fascinating garments of the high priest. And starting with Aaron, Moses' brother, he is the first, and there are many subsequent to him. Now this is all for the service in the I mentioned last week the Mishkan, God's apartment, the special uh, procedures. This is their uniform. And just like a uniform that a restaurant worker or uh, even a military uh, person would be wearing, just as if you're working in a restaurant, you're expected to wear the uniform of a restaurant uh, person in there. But when you go home, you don't have to wear that. And similarly, someone in the military, they're doing their military service, they wear that when they are in service, but when they go back home, they don't need to wear such clothing. And so too is, the, so too is it here. For the service in the, the Mishkan, in God's apartment, as it were, and, and subsequently, once King Solomon builds the temple, then ultimately the temple, and uh, both the first and subsequently the second temple, there, these garments are to be worn. These uniforms in their service, in their temple service, are to be worn. So that, that's one major piece of this week's Torah portion is the uniforms, the garments that both the priests and the high priest are to wear during their service. Now the second aspect I want to look into a little bit, which is a set of offerings. Now these offerings are to be done as described both in the morning and in the evening on a daily basis. and. It primarily consists of certain animals. These animals are being brought, but not just the animals. There's also some oil, some meal, like some grain, and also wine. So that's what's being offered on a daily basis. The animal is the main piece of this. There's only, we have maybe equal parts of oil and wine, a little bit of grain, but the animal is the main aspect, the focus of the offerings. And what we have on a regular basis, the, the Kohanim, the priests, are tasked with 
the actual service of, of these sacrifices. It's really interesting when thinking about the terminology we employ around sacrifices because they are carbonate, they are being brought forward. We can think about it in English, sacrifices. Now we typically in English think of sacrifices as something that we give up. I'm gonna to return to this, but when we think about it, sacrifice is really made up originally, the, et the etymology, the makeup of it is two words. The first word is sac sacred, sacra, right? And fu, fire. So it's a sacred fire. These, these are sacred fires. The curious thing when thinking about this, there are sacred fires taking place. I'm not gonna doubt that, but it's not focused on what's being sacrificed. That seems to be the main piece of, of these sacrifices. And curiously, when we think about how we, te we contemporarily, how we nowadays think about the word sacrifice, it's something that we give up, right? We're, it's a contribution that we give up. Really interesting in considering this, since uh, we are talking about things that the children of Israel are being requested, are commanded to provide to God, to sacrifice. It's interesting when we think about this because it's, you know, when we think about the sa sacrifice aspect, is that how much of it is focused on the fire of consuming these things and how much of it is focused on us giving these things up. What's not mentioned, which is quite curious, is the consumption of them. Because to some degree, we could also think about these things as a reflection as a divine reflection of us. Just as humans, we, we eat the meat. These are all animals that are fit for consumption. These animals that are, are being brought, we could eat for protein and there's surely considerable amount of material wealth being expended upon these animals. They, they are worth a lot of, uh, of money. That's a central piece and, and certainly of a meal and then we have oil and, and flour, so we get some starchiness. And we have uh, nearly a liter of wine being poured out every single time for these offerings. So it almost seems like, a div like I mentioned earlier, a divine reflection of human consumption. Just as humans need to eat protein and, and grains and drink wine, so too we offer these as a morning meal and as an evening meal to God. This is his, this is his meal really fascinating when we consider it in, in those terms. Now, ultimately, this is not the only articulation of sacrifices or, um, or libations. We have a much more, th there's more later on. We have a little bit in Leviticus, but actually the primary place for all this is in the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, we have earlier on a little bit about the daily offerings and then really a fuller expression of all the different holiday offerings in chapters 28 and 29 of the book of Numbers a lot uh, and about the animals, about the libations, about the oil, a lot of really fascinating stuff which is for another Torah portion to discuss. It's not for our context. Although curiously, this week's Torah portion is the first time that we see a, a wine libation and certainly for that matter a mandate for Jewish libation. The only other, the only previous libation that we see in the entirety of the Torah is in the book of Genesis where Jacob, seemingly inspired, offers a libation unspecified of what liquid, could be wine, could be water, unclear. But in this week's Torah portion, this is actually the very first time we see articulated a, a wine libation and specifically for us to be commanded to offer that. So. That's a, that's a first. It's a Torah first for us in this week's Torah portion. So that we have is uh, Parsha Titzava, continuing on from what is to be, what is to be, how the Mishkan, God's resident, is, residence, is to be furnished. Now we see practice what's going both with the, the priests in their uniforms and what they should be doing while wearing these uniforms and in their service uh, in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, in, in God's Pieter, as it were, in his apartment. So. I hope that's a little bit helpful. There's no particular, there's no, it's not, there's no narrative excitement going on in this week's Torah portion. It's God telling the Jewish people uh, prescriptions of what to do. So with that, I hope everybody has a happy Purim and I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom.